Our ancestors could not possibly have foreseen all the amazing technology that we are surrounded by today. But what about us? Would we also be shocked if we were shown the technology of the future? It's looked upon as obvious today that children are growing up in a world that is very much different from the world their parents grew up in. It didn't used to be like that. During most of human history there haven't been much change from one generation to another. If we go a few thousand years back, not much would change in a hundred years. Now a lot happens in ten years. It's not only in the evolution of technology that change has happened faster and faster. The same goes for biological evolution. We're not sure, but we think there is roughly 3.8 billion years since life appeared on Earth. But only 2 billion years, roughly half that time, since the first complex cells appeared. Only during the last fourth of the time there has been life on Earth have we had organisms with more than one cell. And only during the last sixth of the time have we had animals. The first mammals appeared roughly 200 million years ago, meaning that there has been life on Earth for 19 times as long as there has been mammals. And then we have us, humans. Only 200,000 years ago did we start looking as we do today. Meaning that there's been life on Earth for roughly 19,000 times as long as we've been here. Of our 200,000 year old history, roughly 10,000 have taken place after the invention of farming. And less than 300 years have taken place after the start of the Industrial Revolution. No way are things going to stop progressing here. We're just getting started. I think we're grossly underestimating the future by thinking linearly instead of exponentially. If you count to 30, you get to... 30. But if you take 30 steps exponentially, you end up with 1 billion. We're evolved to think linearly, but a lot of the technological progress that's taking place is exponential. Take for example Moore's Law. Moore's Law states that the number of transistors that can be placed in an area doubles roughly every 18 to 24 months. Here's a graph that shows Moore's Law since the 1970s. At first it seems like a linear progression, but that's because the y-axis is exponential. Meaning that the straight line doesn't increase with the same amount again and again, but increases tenfold again and again. A thousand, ten thousand, a hundred thousand, and so on. The graph shows an increase of a million fold, which is what we would expect with Moore's law. The shrinking of two dimensional circuits made of silicon will end sooner or later. But newer technologies that can carry on the exponential improvement for a long time are underway and will be there in time. Moore's law is just one out of several exponential and predictable trends within information technology. I won't go through all of them, but I will show you a couple of more graphs with exponential y-axis, all taken from inventor and futurist Ray Kurzweil. This graph shows the average price of transistors. In 1968 you could get one transistor for one dollar, while in 2002 one dollar could buy you almost four million transistors. This graph shows the price of magnetic data storage. Unlike the other graphs, it has an exponential y-axis. It turns out that in 2004, you could store more than 19,000 times as much per dollar as you could in 1990. This graph shows how many calculations per second you can buy for $1,000. And like the other graphs, it has an exponential y-axis. However, since the doublings are going faster and faster, the curve is still bent. In 1900 we saw a doubling every third year. In 1950 we saw a doubling every second year. In 2000 we saw a doubling every 12 months. And now the doubling time has decreased to less than 11 months. Computers continue to be able to do more and more impressive things. Recently a computer from IBM was able to beat the best human players in Jeopardy. Still, computers are nowhere near as amazing as the human brain. They can't read a book and understand what it means. And they don't get your jokes. But will they one day? Will computers once be able to do everything we can do? At least it should be possible in theory. We know that because we already have a machine that thinks like we do. The human brain. That might sound like a stupid thing to point out, but think about it. If we want to learn how a machine can think like we do, we can learn how it can be done by looking at how the brain does it. Still there is more we don't know about the brain than we do know, but our knowledge about the brain is increasing and our ability to study it is increasing exponentially. According to Ray Kurzweil, the space resolution of brain scanning is doubling every year. To me it seems obvious that it's a question of time before we understand the brain and are able to imitate what the brain does with computers. And as we understand more and more of the brain, it's also a question of time before we understand what distinguishes the brain of a genius from the brain of a normal person. If we can imitate what the brain of a normal person does, we should also be able to imitate what the brain of a genius does. 
once we fully understand the principles underlying genius, we should sooner or later be able to make computers that are smarter than any human who has ever lived. Imagine thousands of digital Albert Einsteins, Sir Isaac Newtons, Thomas Edison's, and Leonardo da Vinci's working together. Think about how much that would hasten the progression of science and technology. But it doesn't stop there. These computers could also keep the advantages that computers already have over humans. After all, computers don't have to sleep. They think a lot faster than the human brain does. And they don't make careless mistakes. They have perfect memory. They can access all the world's knowledge through the internet. And they're a lot better at thinking mathematically than we are. And so on. With these super machines, we can imagine that scientific and technological progress would go a lot faster than it does today. They would be able to take science and technology to a whole new level. But it doesn't stop there. These machines would also be better than us at creating intelligent machines. Enabling them to design machines that are even smarter than they are. Which again would be able to create machines that are smarter than they are. Which again would be able to create machines that are even smarter than they are. And so on. This explosion of science, technology and intelligence has been referred to by many as the singularity. Futurist and inventor Ray Kurzweil has theorized extensively about this and written a book called The Singularity is Near. He estimates that the singularity will take place somewhere around the year 2045. Considering the amazing feats we already have achieved with the very limited intelligence we have today, we should have great expectations for what can be done with such intelligences at our disposal. Just about anything that's theoretically possible for us to do will also be practically possible. One of the things that will become possible is to eradicate involuntary death and aging, enabling us to stay young and healthy as long as we wish. Aging is really the buildup of molecular damage, and with sufficiently advanced technology this damage can be repaired. Ideas for how this can be done have already been outlined by scientist Aubrey de Grey. Another thing that will be possible is to create digital virtual worlds that we can spend time in, and that will seem just as real as the real world. Kind of like in the Matrix, but voluntary and a lot nicer. In a virtual world, everything is possible. Imagine how it would be if you could do and have anything you wanted. Well, that's pretty much what it's gonna be like. Our imaginations will be our only limit, if any. It's been claimed that advanced nanotechnology will bring around a second industrial revolution. That might sound like an overstatement, but I don't think it is. For starters, nanotechnology will give us the ability to make things such as solar panels that can provide us with much cheaper energy than fossil fuels, cheap materials that have 50 times the strength to weight ratio of steel, and nanobots that can fix our bodies from within. That's all well and good, but the real promise of nanotechnology lies in molecular manufacturing. We'll be able to make products with atomic precision, building them bottom up, molecule by molecule. Given the amazing products we're already able to make with today's in comparison primitive building techniques, imagine how amazing products we can make when we can choose where each atom is to be placed. It might seem reasonable to assume that large products that are built molecule by molecule are going to be extremely expensive, but the exact opposite will be the case. Atomically precise products can be made by so-called nanofactories. These will have lots of molecular assemblers that make small parts molecule by molecule. And these parts will be put together into larger parts that again will be put into larger parts and so on. Such a nanofactory would be able to make different products depending on what it's asked to make by its software. One of the things a nanofactory could make is a new nanofactory. When we have a small factory we can make the pieces that are needed for a bigger one. And once a bigger one has been made, it can make one that's even bigger. Once we have a full-sized nanofactory, it can make a new one, and then these two nanofactories can make another two, and so on. This will make the manufacturing of products almost free. What we'll be paying for is the licensing of the design, and the raw materials. The idea of nanofactories is not without skeptics, but it has been analyzed seriously by scientists, and withstood scrutiny. Enabling us to turn raw materials that today are considered to be of almost no value into fantastic super products, almost for free, would enable us to solve our challenges of resource scarcity and our problems with global poverty. 
molecular nanotechnology will also enable us to cheaply pull CO2 back from the atmosphere. With all this technology, we will be able to spread out into the universe, living more comfortably in space than we are living on Earth today. This can solve our challenges of population growth, but the way I see it, it's about much more than that. We wouldn't look at ourselves or the people we care about as being half as valuable if the world population was the double of what it is today. And we wouldn't look at life on Earth as being less valuable if we learned that there was human-like life elsewhere in the universe. What I'm trying to say is this, given how important it is to preserve life on this one planet, imagine how important it must be to ensure that the gift of life can be enjoyed on billions of planets. Spreading out to the rest of the universe is also of environmental importance. Our greatest environmental problem is that the universe predominantly is ribbed of life. On Mars, for example, the environmental conditions are so terrible that you can't even breathe. Plants and animals cannot survive on Mars. We cannot accept this. Something drastic must be done about it. Physicist Brian Greene said it nicely. Just as we envision all of space as really being out there, as really existing, we should also envision all of time as really being out there, as really existing too. To say it another way, the past and the future are just as real as the present. They are just placed differently in time. I believe that the universe predominantly is a good place. I think it's filled with enormous amounts of happiness, pleasure and meaning. And that the amounts of suffering contained in the universe are neglectable by comparison. When looking at the world now, and when looking backwards in time, this might seem very far from obvious. But I am convinced that the past and the present form a very tiny fraction of the universe. The future is much larger. Not only is the future of humanity long, but it will also take place on many more planets than just one. Today the worst negative feelings we know of are much stronger than the best positive feelings we know of. We simply aren't acquainted with any positive feelings that are as intense as the feelings of being burned alive or sliced open. But that's because evolution made it so, not because that's the way it always has to be. With sufficiently advanced technology, we will have the option of changing our bodies and our brains, making us into more than we already are. We can make ourselves smarter and we can make ourselves happier, greatly enhancing our positive emotions. After all, why should we impose on ourselves to settle with things exactly as they are, just because evolution made it so? In quantum physics you're not certain what's going to happen. You don't know when a radioactive atom is going to decay. You don't know exactly where an electron is going to be placed in a specific moment in time. Instead of dealing with certainties, we deal with probabilities. There are several interpretations of what this could mean. One of these is the many worlds interpretation. It states that all of the different outcomes that could occur, do occur, but in different universes that our current universe splits into. At every instance of time a new universe is created for each possible combination of quantum outcomes for all of the particles in the whole universe. Needless to say that's an insanely large number of universes. Mentioning this might seem a little out of the blue, but somehow it seems wrong to live without. I believe in absolute victory for the human race. But it's hard to both present and argue for my worldview in a short video. Regardless of whether or not you're convinced, I hope I at least made you interested in learning more and in thinking more about the potential of technology. An effort towards hastening technological progress today is the most efficient way of solving our most pressing problems and a gift to humanity that will last indefinitely. Don't waste the opportunity. The faster we make progress now, the further along we will be as long as technology is improving. And at any point in our future, the number of inhabited planets will depend on when we were able to start expanding. If the future is going to be as great as described, I would surely like to know that I took a part in creating it. Wouldn't you? Progress builds upon progress. Even small contributions that are made today can lead to great results in the future. Hastening progress by just a little bit might reap benefits beyond our wildest dreams. I hope you will take time to think about what you can do. I know I will. Here are some ideas. Choose a career where you can contribute first-hand to the technologies that will bring about long-term technological progress. Examples of fields to work in could be computer science, nanotechnology, neuroscience or artificial intelligence. Send letters and emails to politicians, urging them to invest more in these fields. Make it known that you will vote for whoever does the most to hasten technological progress. Donate money towards the development of technology. I have links in the description bar to courses that I recommend. Spread the word about the importance and promise of science and technology. 
and help me spread this video. It would be highly appreciated. If you're glad you found this video, then maybe others will be as well. Thank you for watching.